Okay, everybody, just wanted to welcome you all to the five key marketing uh, ways to double your tax practice. Uh, this is presented to the people at the Latino Tax Professional Association. Uh, my name is Michael Breyer. I'm from a company called Tax Marketing for You. I'm joined on this phone call by Lynn Beckendorf. And we at Tax Marketing for You, we specialize in helping tax professionals just like you to grow your business. My background happens to be in marketing and Lynn's is in operations. Lynn, do you, would you like to say hello to everybody on the, on the webinar today? I was like listening to you. I was like, okay, I can go. It's hello. Oh, can you hear me? We lost hello. Oh, I can you. hear you. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. There you are. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna say I can hear you fine. <laughs> yeah, um, my specialty is what happens once Michael gets people in your door. So if you don't have systems in place to make your life easier or the right employees to take care of your clients, all that time, effort, and money you spent on marketing is wasted. So Michael and I joined forces about almost three years ago now so that he can get clients in the door for you or help you and that um, I'm going to make sure that you take good care of them and keep them coming back year after year. I had somebody actually call me yesterday and say, what do we do? And I said, that's exactly what we do. We help EROs to become more profitable by getting more clients and keeping them once you get them in. All right, well, thank you very much. And so I'm going to try to keep this webinar now to about an hour's length of time. But unfortunately, when you're dealing with marketing, it's not such a cut and dry type of webinar that I can just give you just a couple things and you can go on your way and start growing your practice like crazy. Unfortunately, there's a lot more to it than just showing you a few things. So I'm going to try to give you a little bit of background first on your marketing, and then I will go into the actual marketing practices that you should be employing at your, at your companies this year. And as you know, with everything going on this year, it's one of those years that uh, you could probably make an awful lot of money if you do your marketing correctly, but it's also one of those years you potentially could lose a lot of your business if you don't market yourself correctly. So uh, that having been said, stay tuned here. We're going to be going through a lot of information. If you have any questions while I'm going through this, there is a box on the side of your control panel where you can type in any questions that you might have. Um, if you want to type the questions in Spanish, that's fine. Um, I'll just have somebody translate it for me on the other side. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, my practice is probably a third to a half uh, Latino. Most of my offices are in Latino neighborhoods. Most of my employees are Latinos. Uh, but unfortunately, I've been too lazy to ever learn Spanish, so I apologize. This webinar is going to be in English for everybody out there. So having said that, let's start right now. And the first thing that you have to decide when you're going to be doing marketing of your tax practice is deciding is who is your tax family. And it's not such a simple answer necessarily that everybody in the world is your tax family. It's very rare that you find successful tax practitioners who try to market to everybody who's out there in the neighborhood. What you really have to do is decide is who is your target market that you're interested in going after. And in targeting those people, what you really want to think about is who do you have relationships with. And the people that you have natural relationships with are the people who are more likely to show up at your business than those that don't have a common relationship with you. Okay? So. Step one is choosing who your market is before you actually decide to do any marketing. Okay. Now, you really want to choose your family wisely because those that you're going to go after, you want to make sure that you're catering specifically to them. 
People want to know that when you're marketing to them, that you're talking to them as a person, that you're communicating one-on-one -on -one with them and not just to everybody out there. I mean, think about it this way. When you get home and you open the mail and you see what appears to be junk mail, you have a tendency to throw it away. And why is that? Because you don't feel that the person who's sending it to you has any type of relationship with you. And it's important when you're transmitting your message to them that you make the person reading the piece or reading the marketing message feel that you're trying to communicate directly to them and to nobody else out there. So, I put down this little saying for you. Be careful the environment you choose for it will shape you. Be careful the friends you choose for you will become like them. That was W. Clement Stone, and he was big in the insurance market. Or choose your friends wisely, they will make or break you, which is J. Willard Marriott, which is obviously Marriott Hotels. So you really want to think about who your target market is that you're going after. All right. So there are general markets and there are niche markets. General markets is everybody who's living and breathing who files a tax return. Niche markets are a subset of general markets. So for instance, niche markets would be the Latino market. It might be the middle class market. It might be people who have just moved into the neighborhood. It might be people who have convenience stores in the neighborhood or daycare businesses. It might be people who attend certain churches. It might be uh, the Cambodian or the Chinese population in your market. All of those are niche markets. And it's a lot easier to be successful and to be the big dog in a small market than it is to be the small dog in a very large market. So for instance, in a lot of your neighborhoods, and when I was registering most of you for this particular webinar, I noticed that a lot of you who are running your Latino tax practices are in Latino neighborhoods. And you are dealing with a very large general market in those neighborhoods. Not everybody who, just because they're Latino, is necessarily going to be somebody who's likely to come into your particular tax practice. Rather, what you want to be doing is thinking about what specifically is unique about those people that are more likely to come to your practice than others. So, for instance, one way of differentiating these people might be based on income. So for instance, when you're doing marketing in early January, and beginning of February, you're looking generally for people who are making less than $40,000 or $45,000 worth of income. Why? Because those are the people who are the most likely to want to come into your offices so early because they're going to be getting the large earned income credit on their tax refunds. As opposed to somebody who's making, let's say, fifty to a hundred thousand, and he owns a house and he's got some bank statements and everything else, he's not even thinking about doing his taxes until the end of January or beginning of February, once all of his 1099s come in. So he's in no rush to come to you. So it's not necessarily that you want to go out and do a marketing piece and say. Everybody is my market. That's not true. At different times during the tax season, different groups of people or different niches are more likely to respond to your marketing pieces than other markets out there. And you need to think about that. So generally, and I'm sure all of you know out there, that you know, you're looking for the low income person at the beginning of the tax season. During the latter of February and March, you're usually looking for a middle income type of individual, somebody who owns a house usually, um, 
somebody who's not as much of a rush to get their refund anymore, so bank products are not necessarily as important to them as they would be to the January, beginning of February market. And then in April time, you should be marketing to people who are procrastinators. Those are the people who, no matter what happens every single year, they're going to show up on your door on April 15th and say, hey, can I get my taxes done? And all of those are niche markets that you should be interested in going after. Now, in terms of general markets, you can break down your general markets to these are my three big uh, market demographic profiles that I deal with usually when I'm putting together my marketing calendar for the tax season. So first is existing clients. You should not take, take it for granted that people who came to you last year are going to automatically come back to you again this year. It is important for you to keep reminding them that they want to come back to you and why they want to come back to you. What services, what benefits you offer that make them happy to come back, that you're going to make sure that you take care of them, that nobody else could do the same for them. This is the easiest type of market to retain each year, but you should never take it for granted because a little bit of marketing money spent on existing clients is going to have a lot higher response rate than spending that money on any other type of market out there. And the difference between retaining, let's say, 90% of your clients versus 85% of your clients could mean tens of thousands of dollars that you're going to be missing out at the end of the tax season if you ignore those people. The second easiest market for you to go after is the lost client. That's a client who's been to you in the past and for some reason or another, did not come back to you last year. They are more likely to come back to you than any other group in terms of prospects in the marketplace. Why? Because they know you. There was a reason that they came to you, and perhaps the reason that they didn't come to you last year might have been, you know, they were unemployed all year. There was no benefit in filing a tax return. Uh, they went through a divorce or they were sick and they just never even bothered to file their tax return last year. There's a million different reasons out there. And usually you can expect that if you do marketing to your lost clients, you should be able to get back somewhere between 10 to 15% of them into your office. You can never ever do that with any other type of marketing out there to prospects. So potential clients, which is the third one on the list, there's no way you're going to ever get 10 or 15 percent response rate to them. It's just a physical impossibility. If you can get anywhere between 1 to 4 percent on those people, you should be very, very happy. And that's not to say you shouldn't be going after prospects and potential clients, but rather your marketing dollars first should be spent on your existing clients, and then they should be spent on the lost clients, and then whatever money you have left over for marketing should be spent on these potential clients. And it should be only in that order. And too often I see tax professionals going after the potential clients and ignoring number one and number two. And that's a major mistake when you're putting together your marketing plan. So this would be an this, uh, example of your existing clients. They're all happy, they're ready to come, no problem. These are your lost clients out there. They're crying because they miss you. Or maybe you're crying because you miss them even more. And lastly, it's these people. These are the people who they might go to H&R Block. They might go to your competition down the street. They might be doing TurboTax on their computers at home. There's a number of different 
uh, places you might find these people, these are always going to be the ones that are going to cost you the most amount of money to acquire. And what you should always bear in mind is this question. How much money are you willing to spend in order to acquire one new client? And the answer to that should really be that you're willing to spend even a hundred dollars to acquire a new client. And why do I say that? The reason I say that is because I'm assuming, first of all, that you all charge at least a hundred dollars to prepare a tax return. And if that's the case, then you would be winding up to do the tax return for free in year one. But that ignores the benefit of acquiring a new client who's most likely two out of three of them are going to stay with you another year where you're going to get to keep all that money for very little marketing dollars. And two, who are likely to refer you to other people that they know are related to to come into your business that isn't going to cost you that much money either. So there's a real benefit to spending money to acquire new clients. And people always say, oh my God, you would spend a hundred dollars to acquire a client? And the reality is, of course you would. If you think of it the other way, if you were selling your practice and somebody said to you, how much do you want for your business? And you would say, I want a hundred cents on the dollar. And it wouldn't be uncommon for another tax professional to say, sure, I'll pay you dollar for dollar the value of your business in terms of gross revenue. Well, what's the difference between buying a practice for a hundred cents on the dollar or just paying a hundred cents on the dollar in your marketing budget to acquire those clients? In all likelihood, you can do it for cheaper by doing it yourself, then you could do it by buying somebody else's practice. So always bear that in mind when you're trying to put together what your marketing budget's going to be. You can usually afford to spend a lot more money on acquiring a new client than you might think about logically. Just And the only thing that's going to hold you back is usually only cash flow that you don't have enough money to spend on the marketing program initially to get it all going. So let me just talk a little bit about designing a message. Okay. These are the five questions that you really need to make sure you address in every marketing piece. One, why should they care about you? Okay. Why you and nobody else? Why should they believe in you? Okay. Four, and this is really, really important. What is the offer that you're making to them? And there's got to be an offer involved. Okay. It can't be that you just say, hey, I'm the best out there. Bribery is very, very positive when it comes to the tax business. People want to be bribed, and you should encourage bribery to get them to come into your tax office. That's what I mean about spending the tax, uh, the, the marketing dollars to acquire new tax clients. And lastly is, don't take the clients for granted. What I mean by that is, don't just assume that because they've come to you year after year after year, that you can ignore them and they're going to still come into your office this year. I think that's really penny, um, uh, what is it saying? I can't even think about it. Dollar wise, penny foolish. And to save a couple pennies just to, uh, just on the assumption that people are going to come back year after year always winds up to be a mistake down the road. Okay. Don't forget, at the same time you decide to do something like that and take your clients for granted, there's somebody else out there, one of your competitors who's marketing to that same person and trying to bribe them no matter what to get them to come into their office. Okay, a USP, and this is not the UPS, 
This is a unique selling proposition. And it's what do you do differently that makes you different by personality, price, offer, guarantee, whatever. It is what makes you stand out in a positive way to your prospective clients. So, Domino's Pizza, their USP is hot pizza delivered 30 minutes or less, okay? Our particular office, we offer the biggest and fastest tax refunds allowed, guaranteed, okay? Always need to have a unique selling proposition so people understand what it is that makes you different than your competitors out there. And if you don't have one of these USPs, you should really spend some time right now thinking about that and then start putting it on every type of marketing piece that you have out there. It should be on your signage. It should be on your direct mailing pieces. It should be on your literature, in your office, it should be on your website, everything. You need to have a USP. All right. A USP allows you and your potential customer to achieve clarity in your business. So they know what is expected when they walk into your office. So in my case, what they should expect is that they're going to do everything possible to get them the biggest and fastest tax refund allowed. That in itself says to them that we're there for them to make sure that they don't get cheated, that we don't overlook any valid deductions that they might be entitled to. It gives them a comfort level that knows that the employees are there looking out for them and that they're our number one concern. And believe me when I say it, that's an important ingredient in making a successful tax practice is when the employees, uh, when the and customers believe that the employees are there to do everything on their behalf to help them out. Okay. The things to consider when you're developing a USP is you should be able to say who you are in less than 30 seconds and less than 15 words. And if you have any problems with developing one of these, uh, I'll make myself available at the end of this webinar. You can shoot me an email and I'd be happy to give you some, some words of wisdom or um, some things to tweak in terms of creating a USP for your business. Offer. Everything that you have, every marketing piece that you send out there in the marketplace has to have an offer. It needs to be easy to understand. It should offer bonuses or premiums. So, for instance, in our offices, in our members in Tax Marketing for You, a lot of them offer things like T-shirts or food coupons or identity theft protection. There's always something extra that the customer gets as a benefit of coming to our office. And lastly, you always should have a guarantee. I mean, H&R Block made their name from their guarantee. Um, I can't even think what their audit protection plan is called because I'm just blinking on my mind here. But whatever it is, um, even though it's a ripoff, it is a guarantee, and people like to know that you're willing to stand behind your product. And that's also another important reason why customers like to know that their tax professional is around year-round. They don't want to know that they're going to come in, get their taxes done, and when they need you in the summertime for something, that they can't find you. Price. Price is one of those things a lot of people think that they should be marketing based on price alone. And I think that's always a big mistake because, first of all, price is not one of those things that you can just like arbitrarily say, this is what a tax return is going to cost. And, client, and, and tax professionals who do that make a big mistake when they do do that. They should be instead making sure that they 
place the price of the return in context of the value of the return. For instance, would you charge somebody $75 for a return if you could fill out another tax form that would produce for them an additional $500 refund? I mean, wouldn't you charge for it? Of course you would. And when you explain that to the customer, the customer is not as likely to start berating you about the price that you're charging them when they see the value that you're willing to place in the process. If you start going uh, advertising yourself based on price alone, all that's going to happen is they're going to call up you and every one of your competitors, ask what the price is, and the one who has the lowest price at the end of the day is going to be the one who's going to get the business. The other thing about price is you should always place price in terms of terms. So what do I mean by that? Well, when you're presenting bank products, it's a lot easier when the price is presented as part of what the total refund is as opposed to standing alone. It's a lot easier for people to pay the price of your tax preparation services when they can put it on a credit card and no cash has to come out of their pocket. People want to see that you're amenable to offer them as many various terms as possible to ease it, their cash flow burden. Remember, when people are coming in, they're hoping for a refund. Most of them are getting a refund, and the last thing that they really want to be doing is shelling out money from their own pocket ahead of time before they even get their refund from the IRS. Time. All marketing pieces that you do, no matter what, has to have a deadline. If you don't have a deadline, then you have a problem because there's no urgency for them to come in and get their taxes done right away. You need to create urgency. When you send out a marketing piece, like right now, if you send out um, a scratch-off card or something else right now, or you even run a radio commercial, it should have a deadline, perhaps like February 15th, which would be like the end of peak time. You should never have an open-ended offer because if that's the case, the customer is not likely to value it as much, and the natural tendency for people is to procrastinate. And if it's to procrastinate, they're going to keep waiting and waiting and waiting, and they might inevitably never come in. But when you create an urgency to say that it has to be used by such and such a day, the likelihood is that they will come in before that day is up. All right, well, this just says procrastination is a natural response. Okay? All right, I mentioned this before, which is a guarantee. Okay? Everyone wants one. You should have a guarantee. Whatever your guarantee is, you should have it posted up around your office and let people know that you're willing to guarantee your tax preparation services. You should not take it for granted or t assume that the customer knows about your guarantee. You should make sure that your guarantee is everywhere and anywhere it can possibly be. All right, repetition. One thing I, I always like to say to my members out there is there is nothing wrong with repeating a message time after time after time after time. And I'm going to show you a chart later on in this webinar, but the likelihood is that people don't necessarily get the message one time. And those of you who are doing very few types of marketing are really missing the boat. Because in general, people don't respond to only one type of marketing one time only. What they respond to is multiple types of marketing multiple times. So whenever a client comes into one of our offices, we always say to him or her, how did you hear about us? And they might say inevitably that they heard a radio commercial. And I will say to them, oh, that's great. And then they might say 10 seconds later, and by the way, one of my friends also comes here. Oh, and I saw your TV ad there. And, oh, 
that postcard. Oh, you know what? I get a postcard like that in the mail too. So it's not necessarily, it might be the one thing that got them to take the action this particular moment when they came in, but it was the repetition of the same message to them before that, which got them to the point to finally take the action on the last marketing piece that they ran across there. So if you have a choice to send one message out to a large market or to take that market, divide it up into three, and to send out three messages to only a third of the market, you would much rather do three times to a smaller market than one time to a larger market because the repetition will create the greater response down the road. People need a minimum of three to five times before they usually take action. Now, if you think about H&R Block again, sorry to keep mentioning this, but they don't mention about their deals one time, two times. I mean, you can pretty much watch every half hour of TV on almost every TV station, and you will see another commercial. Why? Because they know that's what works. If they're not on all the time, it's not going to be as effective. Now, you might say to yourself, well, isn't that annoying? And the truth of the matter is, no. It's not annoying to the people. Why? Because a lot of times when you're hit and bombarded with commercials and advertisements and things like that, a lot of times it goes in one ear and out the other. So you don't always recall that you've been that you've been supposedly annoyed so many times by this particular tax preparation firm. So I would never worry about annoying. And if annoying is what I get blamed for by marketing too many times, then you know what? I'll be a happy person because I know that it's going to produce results in order to double my tax practice in the coming year. So make sure that whatever your message is, Whatever you're saying to the people out there, it's got to be relevant and interesting. Relevant, so in other words, it's got to have something that's going to give to them. What's in it for them? That's what they want to know. Interesting means fun. Because the more fun your advertisement can be, the more it stands out from everybody else's, the more memorable it's going to be the more likely they are to actually respond to it. All right, so now let's talk about some particular types of marketing. And this is not necessarily um, number one for you, but this happens to be number one for me, and I'm going to try to play this, and hopefully this is going to actually work on this webinar. I'm impressed it actually worked. So one of the ways that we've grown our business has been from TV. And I will tell you this about TV. One, do not advertise on cable TV. The reason is because it's very hard, as I was talking about before, to choose your market. Okay? The family of people that you're trying to attract is very difficult on cable channels, even though it's cheaper. Rather, what's better is network TV. And if you're in the bank products market especially, you want to be looking at advertising during the day on channels like Fox and the CW Network and channels like that that cater to that particular demographic profile of people who would be home, who don't earn a lot of money, who usually get a large earned income credit. That's the type of people out there that you want to attract. Now, if you live in a big major city, it still might be prohibitively expensive for television. But assuming that you don't live in L.A. or Chicago or New York, 
you'd be surprised how inexpensive television can be. In fact, for a lot of my television commercials, I pay less for those than I actually pay for my radio commercials. But television, the reason that television is so successful is people like to see other people. And when they see other people live and they feel that it's a, a live, a real thing, they believe more wholeheartedly in the message that's being delivered than they would in anything else that might be given to them. All right, I want to keep moving along here. Next one up is radio commercials. And if I'm lucky here, this might be a Latina commercial. Nope, let me try the other one just out of curiosity. I'm not going to play the whole, the whole commercial, but you get the idea, obviously, from, from that commercial about what I'm trying to do. One, I'm trying to differentiate myself by advertising things such as premiums that nobody else is offering. Two, I'm trying to make it a little bit interesting by changing up the voices that I use in the commercials because it's more likely that people are going to pay attention to it. When you're doing radio commercials, um, and especially on Latina channels, the commercials, if you've ever listened to them, and really, I mean, just sit there quietly and listen, the commercials tend to sound all alike. And that's really the fault of the people who are recording them at the radio stations that they think that's the perfect way to do it. And while it might be a good way, if every commercial sounds the same, eventually nobody's paying attention because you don't know the difference between a tax return commercial and a used car dealer and a cleaning service and whatever else is out there in terms of commercials. They all start to sound alike. And the last thing you want to do is you want to be boring. If nothing else, always try to make yourself the most interesting possible, offering the most interesting premiums, bonuses, guarantees, anything out there that makes you different than everybody else out there. Okay. Definitely one big thing that you need to have in every tax office are banners, billboards, and signage on the outside and inside of the building. You need to think about this from the perspective of the customer. What is it that the customer sees when they come to the office? And you want to be sending them a message both outside and inside when they come in. All signage is good signage to have up there. Okay, and one reason that we have television sets in all the offices is always because we record commercials for them to be watching because in a way that creates more signage for them to become aware of. Okay, you should have banners everywhere. Banners are fairly inexpensive, so for the price of a banner, you can get even if you just get a half a customer out of it, you've already paid for the banner itself. So the more banners you can have, the better off you're going to be. All right, newsletters, e-zines, and direct mail. I'm going to skip over newsletters because I don't think it's necessarily one of the most effective ways for you guys to be marketing your businesses, but it does have a place, okay? So I didn't want to skip it totally, but I didn't really want to spend any time. I just want to make mention 
that there is a benefit to sending out newsletters to your customers on a continuous basis. All right, let's talk about mail, direct mail specifically. You should all be using direct mail to send out to, first of all, your existing customers, second of all would be your lost customers, and third would be to potential clients out there. And what I wanted to do is to give you an example of some of the pieces or at least a couple of the pieces that we've created for our tax coaching members that you could just take a look at just so you have some ideas here. And I'm not sure which one this was. So this is one that we've created, which is, as you can see, a check that gets mailed out to customers. And it's an economic stimulus check. Um, I happen to write it in English. I could have written it in Spanish just as easily, but I tend to write most of my pieces in English because all my Latina customers can usually read English, but if I wind up sending it to somebody who doesn't speak Spanish, it's just a waste of money anyways. So um, when you look at that, you should be saying to yourself, hmm, that's something interesting that's differentiated. So it comes in a double window envelope. So where the logo is on the top right, hand, top left hand corner would show, and the customer's name. So this is personalized to them, and it's an actual check. If you look at it, one second as it pops up on the screen. This is the back of the check here, and you can tear it off and bring it into our offices to get the twenty-seven dollars off. And it comes in an envelope that says economic stimulus enclosed, do not bend this. And so we've created one of these pieces both for existing customers, for lost customers, for prospects, and also for new people who have just moved into the neighborhood who've just bought a house. Another piece that I wanted to show you, if it, uh, right here. So this is what's called a scratch card. And what's nice about this is the circle that I'm showing you here right in the middle is actually a medallion. And below that would be a dollar amount of how much of a discount you're willing to give the customer to come into your office. So, for instance, I usually give them $50 off, and I send this usually to prospects out there. So all of the postcards that I send out are $50. It's got my name and my phone number on here. The back of it's got testimonials. It's got all my office locations. Um, it has all the other contact information that anybody would need to come into the office. So I've always had a lot of good luck and a direct mail piece like this. And the reason why is because especially when you send this to a low-income type of demographic, they love the idea of lottery tickets. The other thing that I've tried to do over the years is I try to use the card and to cater it to the different piece, uh, different members of the family that I'm trying to attract. So sometimes I'll use just a single girl who might be a uh, uh, Spanish um, complexion to her. If I'm sending it to an African-American neighborhood, I would have an African-American girl there. If I'm sending it to a white neighborhood, I would have a, a white girl there because the reflection of the person who you use on the card is usually a reflection upon the people that you're sending it to so they feel that you actually understand who it, who it is that uh, you're talking to. Okay. So I found this to be a very productive piece over the years. And anything that I show you here, if you guys are interested in getting more information about it, if you want to send an email to me, I'll give you my email address afterwards. But it's michael at taxmarketingforyou.com, and I'd be happy to, to share some of these pieces with you. Moving on business prospect and postcards, and I don't want to really spend too much time, but just as an aside, I don't know if it's going to work, 
but you can also send out pieces specifically to people who happen to be in particular types of businesses. Mm. Here we go. You'll have to bear with me. So this is a piece we send out to hairdressers, daycare providers, contractors, doctors out there. So you can always, notice how I'm always trying to cater my message to exactly who my market is. Yellow pages. Well, the one thing I'm not going to show you is an example of the yellow pages. Now, I was always a big proponent of the yellow pages, and I was always the one who had the largest ad in the yellow pages. But as technology has changed and as people have changed and more people have cell phones and less people have actually home phones and get the yellow pages, I have found that the money invested in the yellow pages is a waste. I would also say to you, stay away from the yellow page person who's going to try to sell you on their internet presence that they can get you better listings because they're the yellow pages. I'm here to tell you that's not true. They do a lousy job for a lot of money and you can do much better in other different ways. So save your money. Don't spend it on the yellow pages. All right, let's talk a little bit about these things, which is websites, Google Maps, pay-per-click, and chatting. Websites, you should all have a website. If you don't have a website, well, send me an email, and I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to have a website because the majority of people nowadays, and it doesn't really matter whether they're low income or high income or middle income or Latina or non-Latina or, or blue or black or green or whoever they are, a lot most people nowadays when they're looking for a particular business are going to go on the Internet and do a search there. That's why the yellow pages are out and that's why websites are in. And it's important to have a good website, one that attracts them into the website to spend some time to get to know who you are and what your message is, as opposed to one of those websites that you can buy for very cheap money, but they look like a very cheap website and not one you're going to spend any time on. As far as Google Maps go, if you go and write this down, I hope you're taking some notes here. You should write this down. Go to uh, Google and then type in Google Maps, and it will take you to a website where you can log in and create yourself a Google account. You should create your business on Google Maps. And the reason I say that is because when people do a search, and if you've ever done a search before, it will pop up for tax preparation businesses around that area with your information, but only if you contribute to add your information to their site. They're not going to do it for you. It doesn't cost you any money to add yourself to it, but you need to do it now because it takes some time before you start getting listed. So it's one of those things I would tell you to do today. The next is pay-per-click. And I would tell you to stay away from pay-per-click because that's paying for people to come to your website. None of you are probably in a position that you can afford to do that. And last of the list is chat. And what is chat? Chatting is this. When you go to a website and there's a person there who says, if you have any questions, I'll talk to you. Now, this one's a picture of a person offline, but when they're online, you can see who's on your website, and your secretary or somebody in your office can say, hi, how is it that I can help you, by the way? And you'd be shocked at what kind of responses you're going to get when you add something like this to your particular website. People like to know that they can get immediate answers to their questions, and that's what they're coming to your website for, is for answers to their questions. So if you can monitor something like this, it'd be very helpful. So the next question you might have is, okay, well, what does something like this cost? And I don't know if I have the link to how much it is, but we have found a site for tax professionals and it's $15 a month, so it's $180 a year, which is basically one tax return for something like this. 
very, very, very beneficial if you have a website. And if you don't have a website, you need to create one and put one on. Next is up is newspapers and advertorials. Now, I'm not as big a fan of newspapers as I have been in the past, but I will tell you this, that um, the problem with newspapers is not as many people are reading newspapers as had been reading newspapers in the past. And if you're going to do it, I would, I would say to you, don't be doing it in the general newspaper of your town. So if you live in Los Angeles, you're not going to do the Los Angeles Times or the Miami Herald or the New York Post or whatever. But if you're going to do it in some of the smaller suburban newspapers or the Latina newspaper, that's fine. What works really well in the newspaper is something called an advertorial. And instead of advertising your business and saying, oh, I have $15 off for your tax returns or whatever it might be, rather it's to write an article that makes it look like it's a newspaper article, but in the article you write it in such a way that you're actually selling the benefits of your particular tax practice over your competitors. It makes it seem like the newspaper itself wrote it for you as a testament to how great you are as opposed to you who really did write it. Events, affinity, and charity. If you can at all do an event out there and get some publicity for on the TV or the radio, there's a lot of goodwill that you can create and a lot of buzz that you can create in the community by doing something like that. And you should really be thinking about what types of things you can work with. I tend to try to find churches or local nonprofit groups that are trying to run some type of event and become a primary sponsor for something like that. It gives a good, lot of goodwill both for the nonprofit agency or the church, but also to its members. And inevitably, you're going to pick up business because of that. Books. Now, this is something that we at Tax Marketing for You just started working on this past year, and it was a, a major drive of mine. But what we created is a book that you actually can put your name on. And I don't want to go into the details of it too much right now, but if you're interested in it, you can go to this particular website, which is taxauthor.com. T-A-X-A-U-T-H-O-R.com. You can take a look there and it'll explain to you about how you can have your own book with your own name, with all your own bio information on it that you can give out to your clients to make you the guru in the particular tax industry in your area. And there's a lot to be said when people write books and they go on the Oprah Winfrey show, all of a sudden they become multimillionaires very quickly because when you write a book, they believe that you know something that nobody else out there happens to know. Coupons. Um, in general, I used to do quite a bit of coupons in terms of super coupes and Val Pack and places like that. I've found that over the last few years, the responses have been generally a lot lower. But there's a lot of benefits to creating coupons and then having somebody actually pass them out in the neighborhood. Go to the convenience stores and make sure they drop them there or they're refilling them consistently. There's, when people get the coupons, they have a tendency to take them no matter what. The other place that's really beneficial to do something like that is also uh, laundromats. That's a kind of place that people are sitting around all the time, have nothing to do, and will always pick them up. So convenience stores and laundromats would be my two top choices for passing out coupons. All right, this is probably the king of all marketing methods, but it's not as simple as just referrals, just to say, refer me. It's imperative upon you to actively request 
from your customers that they do give you referrals. You should be giving them a marketing piece that says, hey, we want your referral and we want you to bring people to us. And on top of that, you should have a banner that says we want a referral. And on top of that, you need to be bribing the people for those referrals. So for instance, we have a referral coupon that we give out to every single customer when they come in to get their taxes done. And we say to them, you send somebody in with this coupon, we will give you $27 and we're going to give your friend who comes in to get their taxes $27 off on their refund. That's $54 in total and I would do it every single day of the week, never any questions asked because there's no tax return that you're going to do that you're not going to make $54 on it anyways. And in a lot of cases you're making much more. Referrals are very, very powerful. But the tendency is for a lot of people not to ask. And you not only you have to ask as the tax professional, but your people in your office should be asking and consistently asking and re-asking. And every time they come in asking, who else do you know that you can send us? Especially early in the season. There's tons of people that people can bring in. But it's imperative that you get a philosophy in your business that everybody is always asking for referrals. Voice broadcast. This marketing method is a way you could actually call all of your clients in five minutes with one simple message. So you can record a message and program it into a computer system and send it out and it gets delivered to everybody who gets the phone call. So for instance, the other day on Saturday I called 10,000 people and I wish them a happy new year and let them know that all the offices are open as of Monday. And what happened when I did that? Well, we got probably 200 phone messages when we walked into the office on Monday about people who wanted to come in, had tax questions, wanted to make appointments, whatever. The cost to me to do something like that is negligible. It's like three to five cents a phone call. And for what it costs me, for what it returns, it's a no-brainer every day of the week. By using voice broadcasting, I don't have to send out as many marketing pieces in the mail because it's all about the number of times that you repeat the message to the person. So if I can repeat it inexpensively with a voice broadcast, plus send them a couple pieces in the mail, plus send them some stuff via uh, email, that's a number of times that they've been touched to make sure that they come back into our office year after year. Social media. Uh, I want to say this about it. Don't waste your time and money on it right now. It's not there to make any money for you. It's got some long-term value for you if you want to start playing with Facebook. But to do what you really need to do to make it work, it's really not worth it. And I would say, don't waste your money. Email marketing. Well, I talked a little bit about this in terms of the newsletters, but the one thing I'm going to leave you with from today's webinar is make sure that you collect an email address from everybody who comes into your office this year. The tendency was to always ignore this, and people would always say, oh, I don't know what my email address is. But whatever you got to do, even if you have to bribe them, you want to collect their email addresses. Why? Because obviously sending them email is a less expensive alternative to marketing to them than sending them something in the mail that's going to cost you 50, 75 cents a dollar. You can send them a gazillion emails for the price that it's going to cost to send out one very inexpensive postcard. Internet video. And really, I have this as internet video, but this should be any video. You should be recording as many videos as possible. Videos of yourself talking about taxes. Videos of testimonials from your clients saying how great you are to have their taxes done. There's a real power to video as opposed to audio. You're listening to me right now on this webinar. 
And that's great. But if you were to see me as I was speaking, or you came to a live event and saw me speaking, there's a lot greater relationship that gets created between the two of us than there is this impersonal in, in relationship that we're doing by me just speaking into a microphone and you hearing me over the internet. It's the same thing with your customers. They want to see you as you're talking to them. And you should have, and if you don't, you should go out and buy yourself like a flip camera or a Kodak XI8 or something like that, one of those little mini cameras, and have it on you at all times to be recording things that are going on in your offices. People love to see that kind of stuff. One thing that we have in all our offices when people walk in is pictures. Why? Because people love to see pictures of other people, and it gives them a feeling of comfort that they've come to the right office because everybody else in the pictures has come to the same office previously. All right. This is what I want to talk about. I can do everything possible to get people into your office, but the one thing that you need to be concerned about, and I don't want to go into it too much, and this is really Lynn's forte more than it's mine, is remember Marketing is only half the battle. As soon as the people call or come in, it's imperative to have good customer service. And it's important to making sure that you follow up with potential leads. These are the problems that people face when they don't do good follow-up of their marketing. So they don't have any follow-up at all, or it's very weak. You know, they might try it one time to see if somebody wants to come in and then forget about it. Or they might jump into the sales process right away. Don't be selling all the time. Sometimes you just got to be giving information and trusting that the customer is listening to it. And obviously, you need to have a centralized database that you keep track of everybody who's interested in coming to your office at some time down the road. So here's an interesting stat I wanted to show you. How many touches does it take to close a sale? So 2% of the time you can close on the first call, 3% close on the second call, 4% get closed on the third call, 10% will close on the fourth call, and 81% will get closed after five times. That means it's not good enough to just do one marketing piece or two marketing pieces or three marketing pieces. You have to do as many marketing pieces as you can possibly afford to do. And that's why you need to mix and match the expensive pieces with the inexpensive pieces if you're really looking to double your tax practice out there. The other key is personalization is important. And what do I mean by personalization? Personalization is about people thinking that you're personally talking to them in unique ways. And I'll give you the for instance that I showed you before, which is this piece that's sent out is sent to a specific person. It's going to be addressed to that same person on the check. The letter is going to say, dear, the same person on the check. Everything's going to be personalized to them so they know that I was speaking directly to them and to nobody else out there when I sent it. I was going to talk a little bit about me, but uh, the point of the matter is you need to let people know who you are and what your story is. So what I want to say to you is this, and I've gone a little bit over the time that I was allowed here, but as you can see, there's a lot more to marketing than simply meets the eye. And what I just want to offer to you is this. I've talked to Tony at Latino. Uh, tax Professional Association, and what I've offered to him is this. If you guys have any questions, if you'd like me to take a look at any of your marketing pieces, if you'd like me to help you out with any of your marketing stuff that you're going to be sending it out, please feel free to give me an email at michael at taxmarketingforyou.com. Again, it's michael 
at taxmarketingforyou.com. And if you see on the bottom of the screen here, it says taxmarketingforyou.com. Just put Michael Ampersand taxmarketingforyou.com. Or you can feel free to give us a call at 877-402-1040. Again, it's 877-402-1040. Just leave a message that you're calling from this webinar, and I'd be, I'd be happy to give you a call back and see what I can do to help you to be able to grow your business. There's a lot of things going on this tax season with H&R Block not being able to offer refund anticipation loans. If you're possibly going to be able to offer them, you've got a lot of great opportunities out there. And even if you can't do that, if you can separate yourself and make yourself different than everybody else, you really have a chance to grow your business this tax season. People are looking for better help, more help, more knowledgeable people. They want to go to the best person out there and if you can market yourself as the best person out there to be able to prepare tax returns you can really explode your business in a very short period of time so I want to thank you very much for your time and attention again it's Michael at taxmarketingforyou.com or 877-402-1040 I want to wish all of you the best 2011 tax season possible Go out and make a million dollars. I'll be so happy for you. I want to wish you a great day, great evening, wherever you happen to be, and I hope to speak to you guys soon. Bye.